welcome to Hope. We're so glad you came to worship with us today. Now check out what's happening this week at Hope. Summer camp has always been an important part of our DNA here at Hope. And this year, it's no different. We will be traveling to Oklahoma City to attend Youth America Summer Camp to join with hundreds of student ministries to encounter God in a great way. And of course, having a blast playing basketball, volleyball, paintball, swimming, and competing in challenges with other teams throughout the entire week, while all growing deeper in our relationship with one another and with Jesus. The cost for summer camp is $250 per student with a $50 deposit due at time of registration, no later than March 28th. If you'd like more information or would like to sponsor a student to attend, you can visit hopechurch.net or visit us out in the foyer. Our annual candy hunt will be March 31st from 10 to 11 a.m. This is a free event for children fifth grade and under and a great way to reach others in our community. Kids will enjoy hunting for candy, playing games, bouncing on inflatables, and eating donuts. If you would like to volunteer to help make this event successful, you can sign up in the foyer or online at hopechurch.net. If you're looking to get connected to Hope, Hope Intro is the on-ramp to what's going on here. You can hear from Hope Leadership on where we've been, where we're going, and how you can be a part. If you want to join us, the next session begins the Sunday after Easter, and you can sign up at hopechurch.net. For more information on all things Hope, go like us on Facebook, follow us on Instagram, and then visit us at hopechurch.net. Good morning, everyone. How are you? Good to see you all here today. We're going to have a great day. This is the first day for our uh, third service. It'll be happening down, down the hall next hour, so it's a good day. Hope everybody had a nice spring break, and we're ready to get at it and head toward Easter. Um, today I wanted to uh, share a couple of things with you before I get started. We, uh, we have a guest out in the lobby that you'll be noticing. His name is Officer Dan. And uh, this is just part of our expanded security uh, that we've uh, undertaken. We, we realize that we live in a kind of a crazy world, and we want to make sure that everybody is safe while they're here worshiping. So if you uh, get, get a chance, say hi to him. He'll be busy, so we're not going to take him into conversation too much. But uh, uh, we want you to know he's out there and will be. I don't know if Dan will be the guy every week, but... Uh, we certainly are planning to have an expanded security presence here. It's already going on, ongoing training and so forth, because uh, we need to take care of business. So uh, that's what we're doing. But uh, today, I want to share something with you that uh, really kind of came to me. You know, I don't know, does anybody sometimes feel kind of burdened for your country? I, I'm telling you, I've had this... In the middle of all the blessing and, and experiencing the kingdom of God that we're, that we're experiencing, when I look at our nation in a time when we should be on top of the world, you know, literally there's a lot, of, a lot of the corruption that's been deeply embedded in our nation that's being exposed, and hopefully good things will come from it. Uh, but the bottom line of it is we are the most blessed nation on the earth in many, many, many categories, and yet we are not thriving as a nation. And I have been, even in the midst of all the good stuff, my heart's been heavy. And, and I think that's probably appropriate because there, you know, literally like the scripture says, there are, there are thousands, thousands in the, or multitudes in the valley of decision. There are people out there that are caught up and that's their whole world. I, you know, when tragedy strikes and all of those things happen in, in, in life, like the losing of a loved one or or a tragedy like the bridge falling in Florida or the shootings down in Florida. You know, everybody is grieving in their own way. And, and we wonder sometimes, how do people without Jesus make it? And that is the burden I'm carrying right now. And um, I've been praying about this. I'm just seeing so much, and, I, and I've been praying about this. And and trying to get my mind around it, you know, what's my response? And, and yesterday, as soon as my eyes opened, the Lord spoke to me and said three things that weren't necessarily just about that, but there are three things that I want to share with you today. This is, you know, I, I think it's probably best if preachers preach out of the overflow of what God is saying to them. 
because if he's saying it to me, he's probably doing it in part of the sense that I'm in part of the covering of this congregation. And I want you to hear it in that vein today. And if you can identify with it, perhaps it will be helpful to you as well. Um, current day America reminds me of a line from Charles Dickens' The Tale of Two Cities. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. I find myself extremely saddened by the poisonous atmosphere fostered in America right now, primarily by the media, politicians, and far too many interest groups to count. Ironically, all this while we have so much to be thankful for. Even with the potentiality of a re rebounding economy and the advancements on many fronts in science and technology that promise exciting enhancements to our quality of life, America the most blessed nation on earth is not thriving. Insidious forces are at work. Um, hear me say, demonic forces are at work. You understand this. We're not warring against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, and rulers of the darkness. And these things are very real. We were talking and singing just a moment ago. Charity did such a beautiful job of leading us in worship today. And, you know, we, we are dealing with battle whether we realize it or not, some of the emotional distress and so forth that people are, are experiencing is really a spiritual battle. And if they don't have the spiritual tools to fight it, then they get caught up in just plain old anger against other people. And that would be a mistake. Yes, in fact, God uses people. Yes, in fact, Satan uses people. And the war shall rage until Jesus comes back and sets things straight. By the way, I don't think it's going to be very long. Insidious forces are at work creating distrust, class envy, racial divide, gender tension, and outright hatred and virtual anarchy. Even the essential attention to matters of social justice have been weaponized and politicized to such a degree that it now greatly hampers actual remedies. The proliferation of social media and the instant accessibility of information through the internet have massively increased the volume of all kinds of information available to us. And we've all benefited immeasurably by the tools this technology provides. However, it too has been hijacked. And even America's enemies are now using it to turn us against each other. As a result, America's emotions are inflamed. Feelings are replacing facts in far too many discussions leading to some incredibly foolish decisions. In terms of public discourse, we appear to be more divided, more petty, busier than ever, and I would contend more confused than ever. The world is crying for answers, asking for someone somewhere to make sense of things, to set it all right. Sadly, the vast majority of those who are making the most noise and leading the various parades are looking in the wrong places. This may surprise you, but I believe the author of this confusion is unwittingly overplaying his hand. For many, the anxiety he is creating will reach a critical mass at some point, and the comforting and convicting power of the Spirit of God will usher millions upon millions of people into his kingdom before the Lord Jesus returns for his church. That brings me to the first word that came to mind early Saturday morning. As soon as I woke up, this word came into my mind, motivation. I believe we all need to ask ourselves periodically, what drives me? What do I want enough that I work for it, that I allocate resources to obtain it? Or what am I dreaming about? Maybe it's more passive, like just being at peace or having enough to get by, or staying well, or being happy. I see something here that tells me we need to take time to reevaluate, at least double check our hearts. Make sure we've got the right destination keyed into our onboard navigation system. See, what you're looking at is what you're going toward. And there's so much to look at out there. There's so much that, that draws us to some conclusions based on three things. All that's in the world, John said, is the lust of the flesh, 
the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. These things are of the world and not of the Father. So those things, those, those arenas for temptation actually appeal to our flesh, our, you know, our body, our soul, and our spirit. Those three things that we're made up of. And so we need to be aware that on all three fronts, there are temptations being focused at us, trying to get our attention and cause us to seek after them. And that's another sermon for another day, but I'm just saying, be aware of those three arenas, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and pride of life. Lust of the flesh primarily are needs or desires of the body. Could be any number of things, food, sexual activity, whatever it might be. Lust of the eyes is more that envy thing. That, that way, we want to be seen a certain way. We want to, we want to have this, we want to have that. And, and the Ten Commandments dealt an awful lot with those things. And the pride of life is really what people think of me. How am I seen out in the world? You know, how, how, you know what can I do to elevate myself in the eyes of people? And so when we start going those directions, we're elevating ourselves in, in this age but we're not taking into account the real priorities, which are the age to come and the priorities that are set by the God of that age to come. And so you see where I'm going with this. It's, it's hugely important that we have our wits about us as we deal with everyday life. And uh, thank God there is a, it's certainly a means to that. We have an onboard uh, authority, the Spirit of God as believers. And he will never lead you into sin in any of those areas. Each of those areas have, have uh, impacts that can be extremely positive if God is in charge of those areas. In other words, if, if the lust of my flesh is controlled by the Spirit of God, then I will have a blessed life. I will learn to enjoy the things that he's given me in the context that he's given them. In terms of the lust of the eyes, I will, I will be able to mediate that thing so that my flesh doesn't begin to run the show. And that's where dying to the flesh comes in. I'll learn to say no to some things and yes to some other things that are in that arena. And finally, uh, the pride of life. The Spirit of God is always going to be reminding me. We were talking in the foyer out there. A couple of ladies were talking, having a little Bible study. And, and uh, the statement I, I think of from Bill Johnson all the time is that we're to live from, from heaven toward earth, not earth toward heaven. The priority is the kingdom of God, seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and then all the other things will slot in uh, underneath that. As long as the first things are first. And so this is the great thing that I believe the Lord was, was speaking to me about. And uh, I think it's something that I have to watch just like you do. It is important that we absolutely look to those things and listen to what the Lord is saying. Um, this is basically a heart issue that needs to be maintained constantly, this motivation thing. And I'll be speaking today largely from, from the book of Proverbs. I, I'm having trouble getting out of Proverbs lately. Uh, in, in, the, in, the, in a world full of craziness, it's a good thing to go back and consult the wisdom of God. The wisdom of God. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Uh, we're talking a lot about making decisions on Wednesday night and the series we're doing there. And Proverbs, of course, is the, is the penultimate book uh, that helps us with that sort of thing. But go, we're going to Proverbs today, chapter 4, if you have your Bibles with you, and I hope you do, whether it's in device form or whether you have a physical Bible. I'm kind of like Bill Johnson. I wish, I wish they made an app that sounded like pages turning, <laughs> you know, because, uh, you know, <laughs> We don't, we don't really read our Bible anymore. A lot of people don't. And I'm saying, you know, I, I, I write in my Bible. I, I decided a long time ago if I had a Bible I couldn't write in, I'd get rid of it and, and, and get me one I could. Because so many things the Lord has said at some point in the past or revelations that have been given in some, some form in the past, I've written down in the margins. I've got probably six or eight Bibles at home, and every time I get a new Bible, I've got to transfer all that stuff. <laughs> And it's a job, but it keeps me in the Bible. How many of you understand what I'm saying? 
But listen to this. I'm going to read it first in the New King James, then I'm going to read it in the Passion Version, which is a brand new or relatively new translation uh, from the original languages, which is phenomenal. And uh, we'll, we'll, we'll look at that too. But let me read the, the scriptures that God birthed through King Solomon, the wisest man that ever lived. He says, my son, give attention to my words. Incline your ear to my sayings. I love that phrase, incline. David and, and, and Solomon both used it a lot. You know, when, when, you're, when you get my age, you, you have, I've shot too many guns over the years, and so I've got, you know, some hearing issues. And, and when somebody's listening, I kind of incline my ear to them so I can pick out the nuances of what they're saying at times. I love that imagery. When God is speaking, we don't just let it wash over us like it was nothing. We want to we want to incline our ear. When you're reading the Bible, incline your ear. And in fact, as we learn to walk with the Lord, we need to realize that at any moment of every day, we might hear his voice and we need to perk up when we hear his voice. He's not just speaking to say something. He's, he's speaking to impart something. And that's so powerful when you understand that. Anytime God speaks to us, it's not just information. It's illumination. It's, it's ability being passed down because he sends his word and it performs that thing that he sent. It's so powerful when we understand it. Hearing the voice of God is essential. And through reading the scriptures, we at least get an understanding of what he sounds like. And he'll always agree with what he said in the, in the scripture. Incline your ear to my sayings. Do not let them depart from your eyes. Keep them in the midst of your heart. How do you do that? Psalm 1 talks about it. Meditate in the law of the Lord day and night. The word meditate was a, was a phrase that it, it literally uh, is a word picture of a cow chewing its cud. Turning it over and over and the cow would swallow it and they would cough it back up and chew it some more. That's what happens when we meditate. You don't get everything from God in surface reading. You have to look into it. You have to pray over it. You have, before you read, ask the Holy Spirit to illuminate the thing to you. If you pray in the Spirit, pray in the Spirit. If you don't pray in the Spirit, get to where you can pray in the Spirit. I'm telling you, that is the key to so much. Because your natural mind is at war with God, and until you can bypass a lot of that editing power your mind has over things, you're never going to grow in the spirit. I'm meddling now, I know. I, you pull your feet back under the chair because I'm stomping today, you know, so just, just be ready. Um, keep them in the midst of your heart. Own it. Own it. What he's saying to you, pull it in. Remember it. Remind yourself of it. For they are life to those who find them and health to all their flesh. I believe in divine healing, but I also believe in divine health. I'd a whole lot rather have divine health than have to have divine healing. Hello? Keep your heart. Here it is. Keep your heart with all diligence. For out of it spring the issues of life. Put away from you a deceitful mouth and put perverse lips far from you because out of the abundance of your heart your mouth speaks. Don't have your heart and your mouth in conflict. Let your eyes look straight ahead. How many of you know that is a beautiful picture of avoiding temptation? The eye gate is the first place often that temptation starts, whether it's the lust of the flesh or the lust of the eyes. What you look at, Ruth Graham said it was, I think it was Ruth, she said, you know, the first look is free, guys. The second look, that's a problem. The eyes, what are you looking at? It's the intake mechanism that we, do, we rely upon probably more than anything else. 
be careful. Say, well, you know, I can't help it. I just see this and I see that. Well, yes, you can. Do you have a neck? <laughs> Do you have a set of eyelids? And th these days, I should say, do you have a, a, a finger to click with? You can resist. And the Bible says you better resist. It says do not let your eyes go there. Say, Pastor, could you get on with it? I want some feel-good stuff here, you know. Ponder the path of your feet. Why? Well, years ago when I was studying some of these things out about the life of Abraham, the Lord spoke to me and said, decisions have descendants. The decisions I make today populate my tomorrow. Can anybody say amen? Can anybody say ouch? Yeah. Because some of the steps you take now result in a destination. You can't take the steps toward one de next destination and expect to arrive at another destination. Make sure you ponder the path of your feet. If I keep doing what I'm doing today, if I keep going where I'm going today, where am I going to end up? That's just, that's just life. We've got to think about that when we take the first step. Because the second step is a lot easier than the first step usually. And let your ways be established. Do not turn to the right or the left. Remove your foot from evil. That's Proverbs 4.20 through 27. Now I'd like to read this version here because I think it's a little bit more conversational. But it's also very accurate. It says, listen carefully, my dear child. To everything I teach you. See, that wasn't just your parents that said that. Pay attention to all I have to say. Fill your thoughts with my words until they penetrate deep into your spirit. Then as you unwrap my words or discover my words, they will impart true life and radiant health into the very core of your being. Now, is that true or not? It is. If you're a person of the word, you're probably going to have a healthier life. It's going to have an effect. It's promised right here. So above all, guard the affections of your heart. That includes our thoughts, our will, our discernment, and our affections. In other words, being honest with yourself, what do you really love? What do you really love? If, if it's something other than the Lord Jesus first, and it's easy to say that. But practically speaking, what we spend most of our, I, if I had your, I used to say checkbook, but nobody uses one now. If I had your statement at the end of the month, I could probably tell you currently what you love most. Our finances follow our passions. Our time spent follows our passions. It's, it's, I'm not saying this is easy because we live in the world, but we're not of the world. And so we have to be careful that we don't just live as a citizen of this world and hope to find the things that the Bible promises us. There are conditions for every promise, and this is one of them. So above all, guard the affections of your heart, for they affect all that you are. Pay attention to the welfare of your innermost being. Wow. And I'm sure that probably many of us in this room get physicals on a regular basis. I'm sure that we, uh, in fact, America is, is absolutely obsessed with health supplements and health products and all the rest of that, and, and probably for very good reasons. But do we ever have a little checkup spiritually? I'm serious. Do, do you ever just kind of back off a little bit and not just assume and 
and, and, and use some standards that Scripture says, and, and then we ever really look at ourselves and see, you know, my, my, my talk is better than my walk. Or does the Lord say, well done? I mean, it's just as easy to have one as the other. But sometimes if we don't, uh, my, my buddy who ran a lot of um, newspaper operations out, out west used to say, if you don't inspect, you can't expect. So it's good for us to take stock sometimes and let the Spirit of God show us where we are. So pay attention to the welfare, welfare of your innermost being. From there flows the wellspring of life. Avoid dishonest speech and pretentious words. Be free from using perverse words no matter what. Set your gaze upon the path before you with a fixed purpose, looking straight ahead. Ignore life's distractions. Watch where you're going. Stick to the path of truth. And the road will be safe and smooth before you. Do not allow yourself to be sidetracked even for a moment. Or take the detour that leads to darkness. Man, that's powerful stuff. But it's so, it's so true. It's so true. Um, you know, can I, can I also just encourage you? I, I have this conviction that I, that I carry all the time about the necessity in our lives of understanding that God's word is absolute truth. Amen. Folks, if there is no truth, every truth is equal. But God's word is the standard pole by which everything else in the universe is judged. And a lot of folks today, they, 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 they look at the scripture and they say, well, I don't, I don't agree with that. Well, yeah, okay. And your point is, <laughs> the natural mind never agrees with God. But you have to take your natural mind by the scruff of its neck and say, you will Behave yourself. <laughs> you know, and that's our prerogative. And the Spirit of God inside us begins to transform us by the renewing of that reluctant partner. We need to understand that natural teachings and natural things will always deduct from God. But God has the truth. He has the corner on truth. And we need to get to the point where we don't really sit around and say, well, I just wonder if that's really true. I just wonder, I, I just, you know, give it a rest. Give it a rest. Now, i got to hurry. The second phrase the Lord dropped into my heart was a statement Jesus made at age 12. The family had gone up to Jerusalem for Passover. His age was now considered, at his age, he was now considered the son of the law. This was his bar mitzvah, basically. Now, he was to take, now he was to take responsibility to learn and observe the commandments of the law. When the families from his village all began their journey back to Nazareth, Jesus stayed behind. Can you imagine all, the, all his buddies from Nazareth? They're all, they're all trooping together and they're going with their families back home. And, and Jesus says, guys, I have some other things to do. He didn't bother to tell his parents. After one day's journey, Mary and Joseph asked where Jesus was, assuming he was walking along with friends and relatives. And to their horror, they could not find him. Now, I've thought about this many times. Man, what a deal that would be. I've lost God's son. What's I, what, what am I going to do here? Man, that's a bummer. But they finally found him after three days. Can you imagine what they were going through? And they found him in the temple, sitting among the priests, Asking questions and listening. Trying to start on his journey that now as a son of the law, he's obligated to do. His parents were frustrated, no doubt, and they asked him why he had done this to them. Interesting question. Why have you done this to us? He says, did you not know that I must be about my father's business? Luke 2.49. There's something here, I believe, that you and I need to be cognizant of, at least, is our natural obligations that we take so seriously and should 
sometimes must be subjugated to our primary obligation, which is to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all the other things will be added. I remember on one particular occasion when God was asking me to do something that my family, my natural family, mother in particular, was dead set against it. But I'll tell you, sometimes you have to just buckle down and say, God first. God first. Now, if you're sure, you don't, you don't uh, demean your parents, your parental obligations. Honoring them is the first commandment with promise. And don't, don't go there. But the bottom line is sometimes you have to say as an adult particularly, I love you, but I have a primary obligation. And it turned out to be, and at the end of the day, they said amen to it because they saw that God honored it. But I'm just saying, sometimes there's going to be conflict with our natural family because they see us in one light, God sees us in another light. And we need to take his view on things before we take anybody else's. And there, there are many contributing factors to those decisions, but just in general. I take this to mean that as a follower of Jesus, my first priority is to be engaged in acquainting myself with the Father and his plans for me. Listening, asking, learning, and assuming my role is the first order of business. The final phase, or final phrase that the Lord spoke to me yesterday morning was this. In all you're getting, get understanding. Wisdom is the principal thing. This comes from also the book of Proverbs chapter 4. And I want you to think about this for a second. What are you getting? Are your efforts primarily focused toward getting ahead, getting a degree, getting a mate? How about a new car? How about a new house? Or for some, just getting up, getting rich. You know, you get the idea. Our energies are, are going toward getting something, accomplishing something. It says in all you're getting get understanding. Let me take a moment and read this to you out of the same version that I was uh, reading before, the Passion Version. It says, my father taught me saying, never forget my words. If you do everything that I teach, you will reign in life. So make wisdom your request. Search for the revelation of life's meaning. Don't let what I say go in one ear and out the other. Stick with wisdom. She will stick with you. Protecting you through your days. She will rescue all those who passionately listen to her voice. Wisdom is the most valuable commodity. So buy it. Revelation knowledge is what you need. Invest in it. Wisdom will exalt you. When you exalt her truth, when you live your life by her insights, you will be adorned with beauty and grace, and wisdom's glory will wrap itself around you, making you victorious in the race. Man, I tell you, there's so many promises tied up in that. If you do, this is, this is the key to God's promises. Almost every promise of God is, if you do, then I will. You can't just go and say, God, I'm just, I'm just claiming this promise. That's bad theology. You only have a right to claim this promise once you have done the condition. That was weak. That was weak, folks. Just because you say it or just because you claim it means absolutely nothing unless you meet the conditions. Plain and simple in Scripture. It's hugely important that we understand that. These verses before and after promise significant personal development and security. No matter what we may be spend, spending our lives getting, these two need to be at the head of the line. Wisdom and understanding. And they're kissing cousins. Wisdom is probably seeing it and having the right view. And understanding has a, has a component of activity associated with it. 
I used to have a little plaque on my desk. It reminded me that wisdom is keeping a sound mind when everyone around you is in the process of losing theirs. That would be a good thing to have right about now. With the rising tide of anger, fear, and insanity encroaching on society at large, could it be that God's secret weapon against this obviously dark, demonic atmosphere could ultimately be a people who exhibit a group of kingdom attributes? Light is so inviting when darkness comes. There are many promises associated with our heritage in the kingdom of God that counter the debilitating effects mentioned above. Here's a couple of examples. It comes from Romans chapter 14, 17 through 19. There's controversy in the church at this time. Some people believe you can't eat meat that's been sacrificed to idols, which was the typical way meat was handled in that day around Rome and places like that. So Christians couldn't eat meat because they'd been sacrificed to idols. When the scripture actually said, if you give thanks for it, it's clean for you. But yet this controversy was boiling. Some people believe you could drink wine. Some people believe that you couldn't. And so the point was this. The kingdom of God is not eating or drinking, but righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. For he who serves Christ in these things, serves Christ in these things. In other words, these things that are contentious. How do I serve Christ in the midst of these contentions? And there were suggestions made. He who serves Christ in these things is acceptable to God and approved by man. Therefore, let us pursue the things which make for peace and the things by which we may edify or build up one another. So in, in the case of the meat, let's just take it. If I'm a believer and I'm, I'm fully convinced when I pray over this food, it's, it's okay for me to eat if I give thanks for it that God sanctifies it. That's what scripture says. But if I'm with you and you are dead set, mm -mm 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 -mm. you're eating demon food there, brother. You're, you're, you're ingesting demons. And rather than me pushing my liberty, I don't need it that day. I'm blessed. You know, I can eat it anytime I want to. But th th this point here that we've got is contention between us. It's not bigger, it's not bigger than our commitment to Jesus Christ that we hold together. Does that make any sense? So I, I lay my liberty aside for a moment and, 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 and basically it says, you know, I, I succumb to the will of my weaker brother in that case. That's what scripture calls it, weaker. I'm not saying it's bad, I'm just saying in that particular situation, that person's weak in that, in that arena. Maybe they couldn't handle it, Maybe especially with the drinking thing. Maybe they couldn't handle it, so I don't want to cause them to stumble. You get that? You get, that's what Scripture teaches, and, and it's really wisdom. I wonder if in society at large, if we as believers would not be so quick to jump on the hot topic that we know we disagree on and try and convince the other person. If we figure out how to love that person and edify that person, they're going to be a whole lot more willing to listen to what we have to say, but even more so watch what we live. Nextly, that was Romans 14, 17 through 19. The next one is, for God has not given us a spirit of fear. So many people walking around just afraid all the time in fear, Christians and, and non-Christians alike. The alternative to that. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, of love, and of a sound mind. Sound mind translates safe thinking. It denotes good judgment, disciplined thought patterns, the ability to understand and make right decisions, and it includes the qualities of self-control and self-discipline. God says, I want you to have a sound mind. My Holy Spirit inside of you is not giving you a spirit of fear. That is a curse. Walking around afraid all the time. For whatever reason that the enemy is able to, 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 to push upon you. We have, all of us have proclivities that, that in certain ways can cause us to be vulnerable to 
this fear or that fear or the other thing. And I know people, you know, that are afraid of germs to the point that they, they you know, they just freak out and they do crazy things to avoid them. <laughs> You're not going to avoid them, but nevertheless, we, we won't talk about that sticking point. We'll just say, hey, I understand. The bottom line of this thing is, God says, I don't want you walking around in fear, kids. Charity just shared it with you. He's invincible. There's, there's nothing he can't handle. The Spirit of God inside you is the third person of the Trinity. He's not afraid of anything. He knows where this all goes. He knows at the end of the day, death or life or anything else can't separate you from the love of God. God's in there with you. He's in your corner. He'll never leave you or forsake you. Understand that a sound mind is not a fearful mind. A sound mind is not a contentious mind. A sound mind has a love quotient that's higher than normal. Because it, even when you see people doing terrible things, you say, God, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. I look at the politicians right now, and I'm saying, oh, God. Can anybody bring sanity to this mess? That's why we pray for them. We don't pray against anybody. We're praying for them. That, that person that sits in the White House, whether you like him or you don't, they're your president. You better be praying for them. It, it's a shame the way we, I remember the previous president, I had a real hard time praying for him. I wanted God to bless, bless him with a brick. <laughs> but God convicted me of that. And while I still de deplore the rot that was introduced in that administration, I could tell you this, that man's soul was valuable. It, it, it's a shame what they're going to have to answer for one day. Our current president, same story. No one's perfect, folks. God, forgive him. Forgive him. Protect us, God. Give him wisdom. Give him grace. Give him knowledge. Give him an anointing to lead us and guide us. And I believe God hears those things. But at the very least, we don't find ourselves guilty before God because of our attitudes and our actions. You know, when I look at this thing, I, I, I say, God, if we could activate two promises, two promises alone, it would help us and those who hear us immensely. And just imagine the entire body of Christ achieving just these two promises right here. The world would never be the same. If they could see the church not as some opposing organization, but if they could see us as the people that edify most, if they could see us as the people that absolutely care the most and love the most and minister the most, what could happen? What could happen? Because I'll tell you something. As things get darker, the pathway of the just grows brighter and brighter, and brighter, and brighter until the perfect day. And guess who he's going to use? He's going to use little old you, little old me. And if I let my light shine before men, they will see my good works and glorify God on my behalf. I'm saying, folks, we're more of an answer to this world's ills than we realize. God has no alternate plans but to use you and use me and fulfill his passions to touch the planet for the kingdom. Would you join me in standing this morning? I'd like to ask the ministry team to join me here again. It could be this morning that God is touching our hearts in ways that cause us to reevaluate.